if they'll ask me, and a lot of them do, you know, well, got any final advice? My final advice is always don't teach them to love band. Teach them to love music. Do not teach them to love band. That's not going to serve them across a lifetime. Teach them to love music, and then you'll uh, you'll produce a dedicated band member um, after that. But if you only teach them to love band, then someday when they graduate from high school and they no longer have a band to play in, they may very well stop playing their instrument. So teach them to love music and playing first, and maybe they'll do it for a lifetime. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now, on to my next guest, Patrick Dunnigan. Hi, Pat. Good afternoon, Mark. Thanks for joining me on the show. I'm really happy I could I could talk to you. And as an FSU graduate, I'm happy to have representation from my alma mater here. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Patrick, can you introduce yourself for the listeners? Tell everyone what you do and who you are. I am director of bands currently at Florida State University, uh, having followed in that position my friend and mentor, James Croft. Um, I've been at Florida State since 1991. Uh, Jim was instrumental in uh, hiring me for Florida State, um, where I initially got there um, for the purpose of working with the Florida State University Marching Chiefs. Um, my hat has expanded considerably since then. I'm um, for a number of years now, most of the time, um, conducting the symphonic band. Um, but starting this fall, we're reconfiguring our bands. I'll be conducting a new undergraduate wind ensemble. Very excited about that. Uh, I also teach undergraduate conducting, and I have since I first got to Florida State. Uh, it's a very unique course uh, in college undergraduate conducting classes meets five days a week for two semesters. It's a lot of time and uh, very unusual. Uh, prior to teaching at FSU, I taught at uh, Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. Great school um, there in a great state. And um, before that, I taught in the public schools in the Commonwealth of Kentucky because I am a Kentucky native. Um, did my undergraduate degree in music education at the University of Kentucky. Did a master's degree in conducting at Northwestern with John Painter, um, the late John Painter. Uh, unfortunately, he has left us, and I still miss him every day. Uh, and I took some time off to complete a doctorate at the University of Texas at Austin. A little school a lot of people have heard of. Yeah, and a little state, right? With a does band they do band okay there, I think. <laughs> it's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. And so there's a lot of connections, of course. One of the things that I talk a lot about in the in the show and with with especially my guests who have sort of are well traveled, I guess I'll say, is the connections in the band world are really tight and that we we have these names that keep popping up over and over and over again. I agree. Um, yeah, it's um, it, it's a big family. Um, I saw somebody post the other day on Facebook, band is family. And uh, that's absolutely the truth. Pat, can you talk about your early 
experiences in music. How did you get your start as a child, and and what was that like? Well, I got bitten by the music bug early. <clears throat> um, before I was old enough to be in the formal training of public school band, um, I wanted a guitar for Christmas one year, and um, my parents got a guitar for me for Christmas. I'm sure it was the cheapest thing they could find in the store. (laughs) I'm sure they thought it wouldn't last um, more than a couple of days. Um, But I was fascinated um, by the instrument and didn't really realize it at the time. I, I had a couple of lessons, but mostly what I did was I sat down with a little record player and just started to figure out the tunes um, from the record. I I didn't realize what I was doing at a very early age. I was doing some ear training um, there quite, quite young, maybe, maybe 12 years old. Um, And it got to be pretty easy for me, actually. Most, um, most uh, popular music songs that I was listening to in the 1960s, pretty simple chord progressions and, and melodies. And, um, I got, I got to be pretty good, pretty good at that. And it ended up not being something that lasted a couple of days and be up something being that has lasted a la- lifetime. Even, even today, that's, um, uh, something I do for, um, as a hobby, um, played with the jazz ensemble in high school and college and uh, have a continuing interest in that. But for formal training, when I was old enough to be in the school band, I was uh, recruited by nest by need. <laughs> uh, they needed some tubas. <laughs> they needed more tubas. I got re- recruited as a tuba player. Uh, also, something I I don't regret. I took to that right away, um, and um, um, it was it was really odd. Uh, I remember being a sophomore junior in high school and thinking I'd really like to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was this one teacher at our school. I think everybody has a teacher like this. He was a science teacher and he was the really cool guy. Right. And you remember him, the, the guy in your school that everybody liked to, to hang around with and he made science kind of fun and hip. And, um, he was the cool, the cool guy in school. So I really, thought that teaching would be a, a great uh, profession, that uh, maybe I could be like this guy. This guy really made learning fun, and I um, I admired that. I also liked music, so I had this battle back and forth. Should I be a teacher? Should I do music? Should I be a teacher? Should I do music? And all of a sudden, one day during my senior year of high school, I realized I could put the two together. <laughs> My high school band director was somebody I also admired and looked up to and knew from a really early age that this is what I wanted to do. Um, I was lucky. A lot, of, a lot of people don't. A lot of people get into college and, and even graduate college without, without a clear focus. But it was very clearly focused for me. And I taught seven years um, at the high school level, uh, and I loved every minute of it. I had, um, uh, I had terrific kids, uh, great support. Uh, from parents and administration and uh, just had a really, really great time. I've um, told people I I would still be teaching high school today if it weren't for really one thing. And that one thing was I felt compelled after a while to expand my horizons into some of the more advanced uh, literature that I s- knew I simply would not get to as a high school band director. Um, I had a pretty good high school band. My second job was pretty darn good high school band, and um, they could play a lot of things. But the Hinema Symphony was calling my name, and the Persicana Symphony was calling my name, and I was discovering the larger world of art music uh, for winds. And um, about this time, late 70s, early 80s, music for wind ensemble is getting 
starting to really get more advanced and take off. And, and I just thought I'm not going to get to the level that I would like to be um, unless I make this move uh, into teaching at the collegiate level. And so that really motivated me at that point because I, I love teaching high school band. I, I think that's a, it's a great job. I tell my students at Florida State all the time, it is a great, great job being a middle school or high school band director. Um, but for me, the music was calling and so I'm here now. So I want to talk a little bit about that ear training as a child. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's such a really important skill. And so mm -hmm. you, did you have musical parents? Was there anyone guiding nope. this at all? This was just all on your own. This was all on my own. And uh, I didn't think anything of it then. And uh, looking back on it now, um, yeah, I see it was a big deal. Um, but uh, no, I just I, I needed something to play. And um, um, I, I had a couple of lessons. Uh, I had a guy show me, you know, how to make this chord, how to make that chord. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, somebody gave me a pitch pipe so I could tune the thing because that, that was critical. Um, but um, no, I would um, uh, I would at the uh, drugstore back in those days, you, you bought records at the drugstore and uh, 45s were still a thing. And I would buy my favorite um, uh, songs and uh, sit there with the arm on the little record player. I had a little kid's record player in my room. And, you know, you could pick that needle up, pick the arm up and set it back and forth because uh, we couldn't set it to a loop uh, <laughs> like, like they do now. And uh, yeah, I would just, uh, I would just slowly at first, but um, uh, eventually I got to the point where I, um, uh, I, I had a really good system uh, to it. Once I figured out what key it was in, <clears throat> I would, um, I could quickly, and of course, you know, we're talking about pop tunes. So we're talking, you know, one, four, five, six, six minor, you know, occasional surprise chord in there. But I got to the point where I could, I could very quickly strum along with the record and then start picking out uh, melodies. Um, and um, yeah, it, uh, it, it turned out to be huge because that, that uh, skill of taking stuff off the record um, helped me um, later, I developed uh, an interest in arranging. Um, and um, uh, I do not in any way, shape or form consider myself a composer. I just don't have that, cr that creative ingredient. Uh, but uh, I do know something about orchestration. And um, um, that too started when I was in high school. Um, uh, and the ear training helped with that. Um, my first year at high school marching band camp and, um, we get to do the band camp and the band director hands out all this wonderful music for us to play. And, um, the first surprise was it was all handwritten up to this point in my life. Only music I'd ever seen had been purchased at a store and had been engraved, right? Nice black and white notes on a page. And this was handwritten and his name was up in the corner and he, we were playing playing music that we had been listening to on the radio that summer. Um, uh, as a kid growing up, Chicago was a big uh, band we listened to on the radio. And so now we're playing all these songs in the, in the marching band, all these songs that Chicago had done. We listened on to the radio that summer. Now, I found this amazing. I, I found this just incredible. How could you know, this guy did this with his own mind. He sat down and <laughs> wrote parts for everybody and, and created this wonderful music for us to play. And I, I walked up to the, to the man, the, my high school band director and said, I, I want to learn how to do this. <laughs> he said, sure. Great. And he handed me a bunch of scores <laughs> <laughs> and, and said, here, go start, start looking at these, figure it out. And, um, and I'll, uh, I'll, he handed me some manuscript paper. He said, I'll, I'll help you figure it out. And within a couple of years, we didn't get to it right away, but with a couple of years, my arrangements, they were playing my arrangements with the high school band. And that meant a lot. Uh, that was incredible motivation. Um, you know, before we had Finale and Sibelius, if you wanted to hear your music played, not just hearing it in your head, you had to find people to play it and you had to copy all the parts yourself and 
um, you know, get them copied somehow and pass them out and then sit there and listen to people play. And for a, a high school kid to have, um, to have his or her own music and my music was just arrangements of silly pop tunes, but, uh, that's, that was a highly motivating thing. Um, that just propelled me deeper into the world of music education. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts for my listeners who might be teachers who have a student who are interested in arranging or composition other than just giving them that experience and encouragement? Is there anything specific that you'd recommend for a student like that? Um, I have, I have students here at FSU all the time, um, ask, uh, bring in arrangements and, uh, say, Hey, I've done this arrangement. Um, uh, you know, would you take a look? And I'm always, uh, willing to take the time, um, to sit down and look at something that they've done. Um, listen to the playback. If I hear something that I think is, um, you know, pretty good. I, I've even offered on occasion to, you know, play for them with one of our concert bands so they could hear it live. And uh, there have been a couple I've even programmed um, uh, because I remember the, 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 the feeling, of course, you know, you're a composer, you want, you understand this composers understand this, the thrill of hearing the product of your own imagination fully realized in sound. It, it's, it's, just, it's just not the same way on the, on the computer. Now listening to the, listening to the, uh, tones being generated. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, we, we used to not have that tool at all. It's a great tool, but nothing uh, um, replaces that, uh, that overwhelming uh, experience of hearing fully realized sounds that were just in your head and an arrangement, the nuts and bolts put together through your own creative process. Yeah. There's, it's an exceptional feeling for sure. Yeah. There's nothing like it. Um, uh, you know, performers have a very similar, but still different experience. Uh, I'm sure, you know, when they're doing a solo recital or playing with a group or playing in a group, performers have a, an experience, but, um, there, 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 there's nothing, nothing really you know it's the um artistic creation process at its most organic where something that is entirely the product of your imagination is now being realized uh in 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 terms of actual sound with actual human beings adding their special um a part to the equation. It's uh, yeah, it's overwhelming. Even still today, I've been at it for a long time and whether it's something I've done for a concert group or, um, you know, the marching band, um, it, it's still an overwhelming film. So in your position, how many opportunities have you had to premiere new works, great new pieces that you really admire? Do you have any good stories from that? I, uh, during the years I worked with Jim, um, uh, Jim Croft, uh, when he's doing the wind orchestra, uh, we, we tended to let all the premieres go to that group. Um, and, uh, I would get to literature a little bit later. Um, some of the new, those, those new things. Um, and, um, even now I'll, I'll defer a lot of the premieres to our, um, to Rick Clary, my colleague, and the uh, FSU Wind Orchestra, um, simply because we're dealing with a group that's mostly graduate students, and it's just it's going to be better. Um, we're premiering uh, Rick and the Wind Orchestra will be premiering a new work by Jonathan Newman this coming September that we're all really excited about because Jonathan's just um, a, a crazy genius. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, um, the FSU Wind Symphony recording of his Blow It Up Start Again is such a classic, that YouTube oh, video. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, the few premieres that I've done, um, we, um, we mentioned a little earlier Kim Archer. Mm-hmm. Um, Kim Archer is one of our graduates from Florida State, and um, one of our students... Um, 
One of our students passed away tragically in an automobile accident. It was a close friend of Kim's. She wrote her first symphony dedicated to this individual. And I remember that being a really, really, really overwhelming um, experience. Next to that, um, this is this is gonna be this is a long story. It's okay. <laughs> That's what we're here for. So, um, in the I guess um, late nineties, I guess it was maybe early two thousands. Um, the Atlanta Symphony did a um, recording of some various works by Philip Glass, and one of the uh, recordings on this uh, CD um, was a piece, uh, a standalone single movement work for orchestra called The Canyon. Great piece. <clears throat> One of my favorite Philip Glass pieces. And so I got the idea that I wanted to transcribe this and um, called his music manager and exchanged some phone calls. Turns out Mr. Glass was enthusiastic about the idea of transcribing this for, for band. Um, so they sent me a score. I got to work on it. I was, I like to work on stuff like that long over a long period of time, take my time, work nice and slowly, especially when you know, you're know you dealing with an artist like, like Philip class. Um, I was going to take my time with it and um, long, long, really, really long story short, he ended up being um um, he was going to be featured as the guest artist for our Florida State Festival of New Music. I'm sure you remember that from oh, days sure. when you were there. Sure. Um, and he wanted to hear this transcription while he was in town. <laughs> a transcription that I was only about a third of the way done. <laughs> So I quickly got the thing done and um, um, remember that he was he was going he was coming to a dress rehearsal we were having. He, he wanted to hear it. Uh, we were supposed to have a little meet and greet ahead of time, but his plane was late. The kids were on a tight schedule. Uh, they brought him right into the concert hall and I didn't even get to say hello. He sat down in the back and we played this transcription I had done without even so much as a hello. <laughs> and um, I was scared to death. I, I, I can't recall any other time I've uh, been as terrified. <laughs> you're right. I mean, yeah. Think about it. You're, you're, you've, you've, you've manipulated his music. Uh, he hadn't even seen a score. I, we, we handed him a score as he came in the door. And, you know, we're playing the whole thing. It's about a 20-minute piece. I'm, I'm standing there wondering the whole time I'm conducting the thing and I'm thinking, Oh man, does he hate it? Is he going to like it? What's going on? You know, is he going to tell me this is garbage when it's over? And so we were done. We get to the last, last bar and he stands up and walks up to the front and steps up to the podium and raises his head and smiles at me and looks at the kid and says, I think this is the most wonderful thing I've ever heard. Would you, <laughs> would you play it again? So we said, sure. And he stood on the podium and uh, we played the whole 20 minute piece again with him just grinning from ear uh, to ear. He gave it an enthusiastic uh, stamp of approval. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I'm really, really proud of. Stands out to me as a really great um, moment in my career um, of kind of artistic integrity to have that that uh, blessing from Philip Glass. Yeah, that's a great story. So let's talk about your position at FSU and let's talk about what it is to be the director of bands and, and in charge of the marching chiefs in the ACC, a program of significance, we should say. Yeah, thank you. I think so. Um, yeah, I wear many hats um, and I'm happy wearing, wearing many hats. I am uh, not one of these folks who... Um, hates marching band. Um, I have a lot of colleagues out there, especially a lot of folks my age, who feel like uh, somehow or other you should graduate from the drudgery of having to do marching band, like it's somehow beneath them uh, into something else. Uh, I don't feel that way. Um, um, I, I still think it's vital 
uh, and very important part of the college experience. Um, uh, provides um, uh, an outlet uh, for kids and music that uh, they're simply not going to get any other way. We've got 420 some odd kids in the Marching Chiefs, and we couldn't service all of them in a concert group if we wanted to. Um, so it gives me, um, as my prime mission, see, a lot of people don't realize what my primary mission is. Um, it's not for the football games. That's important, but it's down the list. It's not um, uh, all that rah-rah stuff. It's my mission is this musical experience for these young people. And as long as they're happy to be there and they're digging it uh, and they're continuing to play their instruments, and um, then I think it's very, very, very much worth my time. Um, I've done the our second band, primarily all undergraduates, for the longest time has been the symphonic band. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's just gotten to be so big though. We're going to reconfigure. Um, our band starting this fall. The second group will now be um, a, a win ensemble experience for our top undergraduates. Um, and then we'll have a large, but not as large symphonic band. And then we'll have a concert band after that. And we still have a campus band for non-music majors. Um, a lot of music making going on uh, at FSU, all, all kinds of levels. And the most important thing I do is probably that conducting class because those are the, are the uh, future high school band and orchestra directors um, out there in the world. Uh, that's the class where I get to pay it forward. Um, I always tell my kids uh, sooner or later, they'll graduate, they'll get a job, they'll, they'll come back and say, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done. And I say, you're right. You can't thank me enough. I don't want you to thank me. You don't have to pay me back, just pay it forward. Pass the message of music and lifelong music making onto your students, and that's all you gotta do for me. So I feel like that conducting class is where I am paying it forward. Um, all the people in my life who supported me and trained me and um, gave me musical guidance and gave me professional guidance and gave me career guidance, uh, I'll never be able to pay him back. So I'm going to pay it forward. Yeah. Do you have one piece of advice that you think is most important to give the students beyond that idea of paying it forward? Is there something you can think of that you, you, you want to make sure they get every semester? I've been on a kick here lately of with my students. Of course, I'm lucky. I get to deal with, uh, you know, older kids in the 18 to 22 range. We've been on a um, uh, been on a kick here lately, talking about the levels that we all pass through. When we started out, sixth grade band or sixth grade orchestra, we wanted to be a player, and we wanted to say we were a player. And there was a lot of pride and that came with that. I want to be a trumpet player, or I want to be a cellist. I want to be a cello player. But we quickly get to the point where we realize there's another level after that because we start hearing people toss this word around. The word is musician. And we hear phrases like, she's a wonderful musician or he's, he's so musical. I just love mm -hmm. his musicianship. We hear those kinds of phrases at an early age and the goal becomes... I want to be a musician. Being a player is simply not good enough. I want to be a musician. For a lot of folks, <clears throat> that's where the story ends. It stays there. We're happy. And that's a, <clears throat> that's a big challenge. Getting from player to musician is a, is a huge challenge. Uh, not everybody gets there. And a lot of people spend their life there. But there is another level. About the time we get to late in high school, early in college, we hear the phrase artist. 
He's a wonderful artist. Oh, I love her artistry. And we realize that there's another level beyond where we are. And that is the point where music making is so internalized and can be produced so organically and with such a unique voice that only certain individuals, it's a, it's a small subset of those among us who get to that level of, of true artistry. I've been talking about this a lot lately with my kids. Um, I hear the word artist bannered um, around a lot. A lot of the TV shows, uh, the reality shows, um, I'm not going to name any of my names. You know, I'm talking about the singing uh, competitions. Sure, I do. <clears throat> the, uh, you, they, they toss the word artist around, and I realize how they're using it, and that's okay. But until you bring a original creative thought to the process, be it performing or composing or songwriting or whatever, um, in my opinion, it's just my opinion. Uh, I don't think you can, I don't think you've enter, entered the realm of artist until a creative spark, something new, something new has to be created where something didn't exist before a phrase being turned in a way that it's not been turned before or um, a particular composition constructed in a way that hasn't been done before. They're reaching that level of artistry, I think, is the ultimate goal um, and really, really, really hard to achieve. You can't banter that word around. And, and, and people do. I, I realize they use it um, kind of in a colloquial kind of way, and that's okay. But to say that someone is a true artist, you know, that's a small subset of folks that we we can talk about. We can talk about Yo-Yo Ma. Yo-Yo Ma is a genuine artist. I recently got to hear him play a, a, several of the uh, Bach unaccompanied cello suites. And, you know, we've heard those before. We've heard recordings of those before. Standard fare. Your wife's a cellist, you know, as well as I do. But golly, Yo-Yo Ma, something different hearing those in a new way, a completely new experience, bringing something new, still um, uh, still rooted in what makes Bach Bach, but he somehow adds some element that just, you know, you just listen to him and you just can't even believe what you're hearing. There's that, that's, that feeling is that, level of artistry when you when you leave and you just you shake your head and think wow <laughs> i've been in the presence of something really special yeah my wife and i actually were just talking about that you know um we have that what the the categorization of we have those of us who are experts in the field or professionals in the field and then who are those that are a cut above and we were trying to think of like who we would say and yo-yo ma was one of the first names we came up with and oh yeah few others but yeah it's a very interesting thought for sure yeah that's kind of where i'm at right now with uh the kids that i've been leading in ensembles so how about anything nuts and bolts as you know the director of the marching chiefs that you would offer for marching band directors out there is there something that uh maybe you learn the hard way that we can spare our listeners um if you're going to be dealing with a marching band or athletic bands that you also have uh, another side to your persona that um, that's not the only thing that you're doing um, and make sure that um, you come home from a long marching rehearsal and on your drive home, listen to some uh, Haydn string quartets <laughs> mm -hmm. or um, some Beethoven piano sonatas or uh, some Stravinsky um, to keep yourself uh, from falling into um, you know, it, it's easy for um, athletic band folks to fall into the same trap that a lot of our pop popular music artists fall into the same trap of it's all the same. 
and um, uh, keeping keeping your mind and keeping your interests um, uh, um, spread out so that you don't end up hearing things all the same way, I think is really important. And it's not that hard to do. Um, but that would be my one advice uh, to all my colleagues out there still doing still doing athletic bands and especially seems like a lot of the young um, coll- uh, collegiate conductors start their careers um, in uh, in athletic bands. Um, just keep keep your focus broad and your interests wide and uh, dabble in lots of stuff because that will, um, that will keep you from falling into the trap of everything sounding the same. So Patrick, I'm just going to ask you uh, one more question, then we'll get into kind of my starred questions that I ask everybody. Okay. I want to pick your brain a little bit because obviously, you know, Mr. Painter has passed away and, and Dr. Mm-hmm. Crofts has passed away. And mm-hmm. do you have, do you have any lessons or ideas that you carry from them in your current teaching? Two things. I think the, um, the idea that I got that resonates with me the most from Mr. Painter was this idea that, and I've alluded to it a little bit already, is that you're not really, um, you're not really a part of the music scene if you're not creating. Um, if you don't have the composition uh, skill, um, if you're not writing arrangements or transcribing music or getting your hands into the, into score creation. Um, I think that's an absolute vital thing. Of course, John Painter did, did a lot of that. Um, those Malcolm Arnold transcriptions that he did um, for Scottish dances and some others. I mean, those are, those are played all the time. Um, and he, he made a big deal out of that, that, you, you can't truly know the score until you've tried to put one together. Um, and then the thing I got from Dr. Croft, I never studied with Jim, um, except, you know, being a colleague of his for such a long time, I feel like I, I feel like I learned, learned as much from him as any of his students. Um, the, the idea that he used to say, um, just about all the time, whichever group, any group he was in front of, be it his best players in our, you know, best graduate students in the wind orchestra, or I've, I've heard him say this all the time with high school, high school bands, just when he was just visiting, the loudest you should play, never louder than lovely, <laughs> was a phrase that he used a lot. And um, I always smile when I think about it because um, there's, there's tons of truth there. And every time I heard him say it, um, whether it was the, his top players or a little country band somewhere, it, it would always register with the kids and they would immediately sound better. There would immediately be a different sound produced, uh, because they were becoming more aware. They were in the moment of what they were actually creating and not just pushing down the valves or pushing down the keys or dragging the bow across the string. They were actually trying to be in that moment. I, I thought that was one of the most um, uh, amazing indirect ways to get to a product. Just a, just a beautiful phrase and a be- beautiful thought, never louder than lovely. Yeah, that's a, that's a, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I teach fourth graders. <laughs> <laughs> We'll try that. Good luck. (laughs) Hi, everyone. I want to take a moment to interrupt the episode with Patrick Dunnigan to to announce something that came across my desk. I recently received an email from Jeff Herwig, and Jeff's a composer and a band director in Western Pennsylvania, and he wrote this to me. Hi, I've recently teamed up with the Semper Fi Fund to put together a consortium fundraiser to benefit combat wounded, critically ill, and catastrophically injured members of the armed forces. The Semper Fi Fund was founded in 2003 and has provided over $200 million in assistance to approximately 
approximately 23,000 soldiers since its inception. They have provided things like adaptive equipment, counseling, transportation, bedside support, caregiver support, and education and career training. The piece that this consortium is centered around, Freedom, is a three-movement, uninterrupted work that deals with post-traumatic stress in the lives of veterans and the process of overcoming it. It is a grade four to four and a half in difficulty and will last about 10 minutes in duration. The cost to join the consortium is only $50, and I will be donating all necessary materials for scores and parts to make sure that every penny raised will be donated to the Semper Fi Fund. We currently have 16 ensembles signed up and $800 raised. The consortium is open to as many ensembles as are interested and will remain open until scores and parts are distributed in late October. More information, including a list of participating ensembles and a recording of the first movement, is available at www.jeffherwig.com Semper Fi Fund. And so I don't know Jeff personally, we've just talked on social media, but I know that this is a great cause and I wanted to bring it all to all of your attention. And now back to the episode and the interview with Patrick Dunnigan. So um, I'm going to ask you these questions. They're big philosophical questions. I don't have any expectations for how you're going to answer them or in what manner. So just kind of go how you feel. The first of these questions, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? I, if if I had to draw the line, well, let me let me explain it this way. Hey, here's here's how I teach this. I, I, I teach this issue, but I teach it through the through the back door. So there are uh, everything we do in life we do because we're motivated to do so, or because we're motivated to do something else. And there are two kinds of motivation: there's intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. So um, if you love music and you love playing your instrument, that is mostly intrinsic motivation. If you like your friends and you like doing the things that go along with music, going on trips, going to competitions, getting awards, those are mostly extrinsic motivation. So people who are primarily intrinsically motivated, the order would be music, the instrument, friends and relationships, and then finally activities, the other stuff. People who are mostly extrinsically motivated have that exactly the opposite order. Activities, friends and relationships, the instrument, and then music is last. I don't teach it as good or bad. Uh, I just teach it as different. And you have to be extremely careful. Everyone agrees. Whenever I teach this unit, everybody nods their head. Of course, we want people to be extrinsically motivated and to love music and to love playing their instrument. And there's nothing wrong with using extrinsic motivators. The problem is, is too much reliance on extrinsic motivators end up squishing, end up um, uh, extinguishing the, the intrinsic side and become the whole, entire focus. When that happens, now you've got a bad thing. If you can use intrinsic motivators, and there, here's your competition question, if you can use that skillfully and sparingly and uh, appropriately to reinforce that which is intrinsic, then I'm fine with it. But if it gets to the point where it has become the goal itself and is extinguishing forever the love of music and the love of playing, then I'm on the side of saying, no, this is a bad thing. This has gone too far. This is over the top. This is not what we were here for. We're here to uh, be music educators, not... um, competition directors. So, so that's how I get to that answer. Um, I don't, I don't want to, um, you know, Jack Nicholson had a wonderful line in Batman. <laughs> Remember the old, uh, Michael Keaton, uh-huh. Bat, Batman movie, Jack Nicholson played the Joker and he had a wonderful line. He said, never rub another man's rhubarb. <laughs> I had forgotten that. That's a great line. <laughs> so, I know there are a lot of people out there that are really ensconced into the competitive scene, and I would never rub another man's rhubarb. Mm-hmm. 
but uh, I think you got to step back. Um, the expense and um, uh, I, I'm afraid a lot of competitive marching band programs are becoming a place where people who have money and have affluence are able to participate and people who don't have money and don't have affluence aren't able to participate. I think that would be a sad state of affairs. Yeah. I, um, I had an opportunity to talk to Wendy Higdon who teaches in Carmel, Indiana. Yep. And she talked about how in their program, they're very aware of what they have and how, when they go visit other schools, they point out how fortunate the kids have it in Carmel. Yeah. And I think that's a lesson that can't be forgotten. Should not be forgotten because all these kids everywhere, the most affluent school and Title I schools, they all deserve an education in music. No question. All right, Patrick, an equally difficult question for some. Oh, for some oh good. for some it's easier. And that's how do you find a work life balance in your career? Oh. Um so yeah, um uh, first of all, I'm I'm fortunate enough that, you know, every day I go to work, I'm I feel like I'm having fun. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm literally that guy who looks at, the, at myself in the mirror every morning going, wow, I get to spend another day with music uh, and teaching kids. And I'm, I'm still that guy. <laughs> um, so to keep it fresh, to keep it real, to keep me grounded, uh, I still play that guitar <laughs> from my youth. Mm. Um, we have a community jazz band here in town that I've been involved with for about 12 years. Uh, that takes me out of my comfort zone because I'm not a very good jazz guitarist by any stretch of the imagination. I have to really work hard at that. Um, there are a lot of people in that group that are way better than I am uh, when it comes to jazz. And um, for me, uh, that's what I do to keep it real, to keep it fresh. Um, it's kind of a hobby. And, and people say, well, that's not really a hobby. Golf is a hobby. Yeah, but I'm, I'm terrible at golf. I can't, I can't hit the ball. I, I, I don't, I still consider this different enough that it's, um, <laughs> that it's, uh, uh, poor, poor Jim Croft. Jim Croft tried so hard to get me to play golf. He would, every summer we would go to the driving range and, and he would hit a bucket of balls and I would flail at a bucket of balls. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, but everybody needs something like that. Um, to get your head completely out of the um, uh, of the routine and retain having a hobby and do things with your significant other, um, I think those are very important, essential things for keeping it for keeping it grounded. All right, so this is a big question, and it goes in a lot of different directions depending on who's answering. And that's what are the challenges facing music education? How do we best meet them? In in the instrumental music education, and specifically in the band world, I think. Um, I think we're coming to a, a critical point um, where we've kind of already alluded to this uh, kind of with the competition. Um, I, I think we're dangerously close to a point where only rich kids at rich schools in elite school systems are going to be able to participate in some of the aspects of, of uh, what um, – uh, of what is considered um, um, good music education in the public schools. I think that would be very, very, very sad. Um, I think, I, I think if I could wave a magic wand, I would, I would rein all this stuff in and get everybody to focus on the adult music maker. That's what we're supposed to be doing, producing kids, who become adults who want to continue to play. Uh, it's amazing to me that there's not a community band or community orchestra in every town in this country, and there should be three or four. Um, considering all the kids that have passed through our door over the past century, um, why are there not more? It seems to be people have this perception that it is an activity that ends for most people, at high school, at the end of high school, some people do go on to college, but for a lot of those folks, it ends at college. Um, and I think we need to refocus. We need to recognize that, sure, the business of life, um, you know, people 
people get jobs and have families and things get busy. I get that. Uh, but I think we could be doing much better than we're doing. Um, and everything we'd be doing in schools would be in support of that notion instead of the goal itself. That concert we're doing or that competition we go to or that trip we go on is supposed to turn little Susie and little Timmy into a lifetime music maker, a lifetime musician, someone who will take joy regardless of what profession they're in. They will take joy in playing their instrument, maybe at home, maybe at church, maybe in a community orchestra, maybe in a community band, um, and they will they will want to do it. They will seek to do it. To not do it would be um, repulsive. They just couldn't even have that thought. The thought has got to be, you know, this is something that is so a part of me that not doing it would be the worst thing in the world. Yeah. It's, it's, Remarkable, those who continue on in music, how passionate they are. I play in the local community band and, and I yeah. just, I just sit quietly and there are people who don't, aren't music teachers, don't have doctorates in music who are, who are taking the leadership yeah. roles because they love it. Yeah. Um, my colleague, David Plack and I took over the, uh, Tallahassee winds. Uh, when you were here, Bentley Shellhammer was doing it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah, a community band, uh, kind of a FSU outreach group. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, those people, I ask myself every week, what went right? Yeah, I got to figure out what went right with these people and bottle this and sell it because that will change the world. They show up every week and, and they just can't imagine not doing it. And... You know, and then when I need, uh, if we need another, right, right now we're looking for another oboe player. We need a second oboe and um, maybe a couple of trombones. And I know in the a community the size of Tallahassee, there are all these people who've passed through all these good high schools that are living here. There are people that pass through uh, Florida A&M or Florida State. And why the hell aren't they beating our door down? trying to get in. Where are all these people? Why did it have to stop? Why are they not walking around thinking, I got to find a place to play my trombone or I got to find a place to play my oboe, see? And I don't blame them. We messed up. We, uh, we screwed this up. We, we taught them to love band and they loved it while they were in it. And we didn't make a strong enough case for the rest of your life the rest of your life. Um, and we got to figure out what that is. What is that key ingredient? It's a really good question and, and certainly worth asking people I know who are playing as adults or who, who I know who aren't playing as adults. I, I, I've asked the people in the community jazz band, you know, what, what, why, why do you, because a lot of them are also in the, the community band, you know, and the, they, they have said to me in so many words, you know, well, I, I just, I can't live without this. So how, how, do, how, do, how, do, how do some people get that I can't live without it and some people can just walk away at the end of high school or walk away. Okay, I'm done with that. Time to do something else. I, I just I don't get it. Um, we're, we're not going to get 100 percent. Certainly not. And I'm not foolish enough to think that 100 percent of kids that's ever played in a high school band or orchestra are going to play the rest of their life. But I do think the percentages could be significantly better because we're not doing really great right now. It's it's a tiny, tiny percentage. Yeah, I, I would imagine it's probably less than one or two percent. I would I would agree with you 100 percent. I think it could be in the point. Uh, 0.05%. <laughs> oh, yeah, you might be right. I mean, what if yeah. we had that to 5%? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It would be amazing, um, the demand for places for people to play. So, you know, if there's any band directors listening to this podcast out there and you're in a community, a small town or medium-sized town, and you don't have a community band in your area, you need to start one. Um, I think you'll be surprised at the turnout and it might not be very good for a couple of years. You might have to shake the, 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 the vines a little bit to get some fruit to fall in place. But um, uh, I, I think um, uh, I think 
you'd be surprised. You could start a group in the community if there's not one there. Um, and let's make America more musical. Patrick, if I could give you a time machine to go back to your high school graduation when you were 18, what advice would you give yourself? But I would say to 18 year old me between now and age 25, you're going to hit some big challenges. Uh, just stay focused. It's going to get a lot better. If you had a choice, what would be the final work for wind ensemble or band that you would conduct and why? Uh, the final work, um, the final work that I would conduct would be, uh, Schwantner mountains rising nowhere. Um, and I choose that because, um, I think that's, I think that's, that's the piece, um, where we can, clearly see the corner being turned. I'd agree with that. And um, there's a lot of pieces before it. Really good. I got a lot of favorites in there. Those whole suites, Granger, uh, Hindemith, um, even those, you know, those important John Sparns chance pieces that he wrote mostly for school groups that are still really important pieces. There's a lot of stuff, but oh my goodness, everything changed with Mountains Rising Nowhere. I think that's the, um, um, if um, you know, people call, uh, Fennell used to call the uh, Holst Suites and the Von Williams uh, the, the cornerstone of 20th century band literature. If those guys are the cornerstone and Mountains Rising Nowhere is a clear left turn to Albuquerque, man, because <laughs> that, that just sonically boom that just changed everything at that point and for me you've got pre mountains and post mountains uh and i, I think we have enough distance now in the uh profession um from that point uh where it's starting to come into focus. you know the, the history of music doesn't come into focus until you get some years away from it a little bit and now that we've we're out of the 20th century by a good bit uh, we can kind of look at everything that happened be before mountains and everything that's happened after mountains. And man, that is clearly, clearly the uh, cog at work for that shift in um, tonality and just the way everybody hears everything and just uh, the textures and the colors and everything. And, um, uh, you know, and it's not that the stuff before that was bad. It's some just amazing pieces, the Giannini Symphony and, and, um, uh, you know, um, um, Stravinsky and uh, lots of lots of stuff for winds and wind band that are that's just amazing. But clearly, oh man, something, whew, something just changed immensely at that moment. All right, is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Um, um, no, uh, just uh, I've already kind of mentioned uh, we're kind of in a new paradigm here at Florida State. Uh, we're going from three bands um, to four. Um, we still have our wind orchestra with my good friend and colleague, Rick Clary. Um, that's primarily a graduate group with some top undergrads. We're shifting away from the two large uh, concert bands then as a second and third band. The second group will be uh, wind ensemble. It will mirror the wind orchestra. Uh, we thought about calling it wind orchestra too, but that's kind of dorky. So uh we decided we'd call it Wind Ensemble, and then we'll have a reasonable size symphonic band because we still believe in that big, big uh, symphonic or concert band sound. There is a, a right and wrong way to do that sound. We still believe in that. Uh, and then a concert band plus our campus band. So it's kind of newsy for me. I'm looking forward to, uh, to doing that. And um, the only thing I would promote is – I would just say to all the my friends out there listening, I'm still amazed at the number of performances I hear every year of my uh, selections from the dancery um, setting, um, which is really a transcription, but it's as close to a composition as I'll ever get. Uh, and it's still, still I have emails every week and um, uh, people send me recordings. And uh, I just want to thank everybody that's ever programmed that. Uh, I never 
thought that it would um, gain the following um, or become so beloved by so many people. Uh, and it's really, really gratifying. And I just thank everybody for that. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, my uh, email address is uh, deep, my last name, Dunnigan, D-U-N-N-I-G-A-N, at fsu.edu. Excellent. Patrick, thank you so much for your time. It's great to be with you, Mark. This is a great series and uh, very enlightening. I've enjoyed this a lot. 